so um, the first step toward neurodynamics is this little review of uh, embodied nervous systems uh, that uh, Breitenberg developed. Um, who, who knows about Breitenberg vehicles? Uh, many of you, so I don't have to give a lot of background. Um, they were originally uh, meant as uh, metaphors. Uh, the, uh, Valentino Breitenberg was a neuroanatomist and he studied these as um, uh, ways of illustrating principles of neuroanatomy. Um, but I think now, in, you know, 30 years later, we can uh, uh, see how they are very good um, ex exemplifications of what it means to be an embodied system that develops cognition. Uh, his first few systems are actually the concrete ones, the first few vehicles, the concrete ones that, er that everyone built in our robotic lab class people built Breitenberg vehicles. Um, the higher ones actually don't work, as some of you might know. They, it's actually not possible to really make them practical. And one could actually think of um, neurodynamics to approaches to uh, cognitive robotics as being the effort to try to actually pull that off, to, to build the higher vehicles. And essentially, neurodynamics is what is missing, I'm claiming. And I'll try to use the lowest uh, vehicle, I think it's vehicle number three, to make that point, to give you an intuition for that. And then the rest, of course, we don't formally use them anymore, but the spirit is certainly there. So what uh, Breitenberg um, essentially argued was that he didn't did that explicitly, I must say, in his book. But implicitly, he argued that there are five things that you need to get behavior. Uh, you need effectors, sensors, a nervous system, a body, and you need uh, that this body is uh, embedded in a structured environment, uh, an environment that is appropriately structured for that body. Um, he uses these little drawings. This is a vehicle, so these are the motors. Think of them as big tires, you know, broad tires, and they will be somehow actuated. And so he's not thinking about how the mechanical stability of the body, how, how much it drags its body over the, over the ground, supposedly. And the robots that we built like that are usually circular, and we have two active wheels on these robots and pa passive caster wheels to bring about exactly that arrangement. These little cups are supposed to be the sensors. The lines are the nervous system that connect the sensors to the motors. You know, the outer uh, environment is structured by, for instance, some source of intensity that the sensors are uh, sensitive to uh, and that has some pa spatial pattern of how the intensity that you pick up varies with the uh, direction toward the source and the distance from the source. Um, I'll go through these uh, in step by step. So what a sensor then does is transform a intensity that's out there, some physical thing, into an inner state of that nervous system. We call that now an activation, and in later in the course, activation will be a real number that varies as positive and negative values. If you think of the activation uh, in neural terms, it might be something like the firing rate of uh, a sensory neuron. It could be also the intracellular potential of that rate. In our uh, later work, we'll see it's essentially more something like the total, um, some, some statistics over firing in populations of neurons. Um, the, the functional relationship between activation and intensity, here written as a straight line, is in many of these uh, examples that Breitenberg studied, uh, understood to be a monotonous function, that is, increase intensity, increase in activation, or sometimes you have the negative uh, monotonic function, increase intensity gives you decrease in activity. Um, if you have that, that's what neurobiologists call a rate code, that is, different levels of activation stand for different levels of the physical thing, of the intensity. That's a code that you find uh, in the periphery of the nervous system. For instance, sensory neurons are like that. For instance, ro photoreceptors in the retina fire a lot when there is uh, uh, very little light and fire less when there's more light, so they have a negative characteristic. That's a rate code. And you have that also in the motor side, and I'll come to that in a moment. You don't have it so much in the central nervous system, but there's some aspects to that. For instance, uh, uh, neurons in the visual cortex will fire more if there's more contrast on the piece of retina that they're connected to. So with respect to local contrast, they have essentially a rate code kind of characteristic. So that's some way of transforming something that's outside to something that's inside 
the nervous system. I'm using as a metaphor later uh, temperature, but that's actually not a very good example in terms of being uh, realized on, on human systems, but Breitenberg used that, you know, what, because temperature will typically have certain gradients in the outside world. So, so effectors, these little Formula One car wheels here, are um, systems that do sort of the reverse transformation. They get as an input some of these inner variables, the activation variable, and then generate something physical. So for instance, movement. Um, so again, uh, that can be uh, characteristic, positive or negative, monotonic. So where different levels of activation generate a different amount of movement. If you look more closely then um, the, you know, in, in, in terms of a, a, a motor, this would be the turning rate, the rotations per minute. I have a typo here, I just noticed. Um, but if you look more closely, you already see that that's not actually 100% true. If you have a motor and you drive the motor somehow, it will depend on the impedance. It will depend on the amount of resistance for the encounter. If the motor carries, drags along a heavy body, it will be uh, rotating less. It will perhaps also depend on friction and other things like that what the effectual uh, motion in the end is that's being generated. Um, so already actually there is a little dynamical system there. That's the physical dynamics of how this actuator itself works and how it interacts with the environment. And that actually turns out to be also true at the sensory side. And engineers among you will know that. So what I just argued is a very simplified picture. In reality, any real physical sensor will actually generate different output depending on, for instance, how quickly intensity varies. So how much time the system is able to sample um, a particular level of sensory input. Uh, that's uh, characterized by its um, transfer function, which will be a function of uh, intensity and time. And there is, in other words, there also a little dynamic system because it really inside this is a mechanical system. The sensor ultimately will be an uh, electrical or, or mechanical system and it will have its own control loop or inner dynamics that will res uh, ref characterize its response. So hidden in these peripheries, there's actually more, just to make you aware of that. It's already an abstraction to just characterize them as input-output functions. Body is very simple. The body it connects the sensor to the motor in physical terms. That is, if the motor moves the, the body, the sensor moves with that. Um, and that is critical for uh, all these vehicles. And it's not by chance that autonomous robotics was very largely uh, the autonomous robotics of vehicles. To this day, a lot of uh, autonomous robotic research uh, takes place in vehicles because this, they have this characteristic that the sensors are moved with the actuators. And that uh, simplifies a lot of things. Uh, for instance, uh, that means that the motors and the sensors share the reference frame. There is a reference frame attached to the body and they are resting relative to each other. Um, it also means that a lot of uh, work uh, can be achieved just by some, somehow servoing, sometimes called visual servoing in, in manipulator work, uh, where you would just change your motor command until a certain s kind of sensor information is available. For instance, until the object is central on your fovea. That's how you would reach. And you never have to compute where the object is. Um, in, in biology, uh, that is the universal design. If you look uh, through the animal kingdom, most animals um, have actuators that move their relevant sensors, essentially their body. Think of fish or reptiles, a lot of, uh, a lot of animals like that. So the, the one dramatic exception is, of course, our arm, which is very strongly influenced by vision, and the eye is not in the, uh, the hand. It looks from the outside at the hand. And that then s requires complex coordinate transforms where you have something on the visual array and you need to translate it into what it means for your hand. And it's evolutionary, a late achievement. Primates are also pretty good at manipulation. Uh, a lot of quadrupeds are, are very limited in manipulation. Manipulation skills with the, with the uh, limbs um, are, are uh, very, uh, I'd say humans are, are the really top in that. We're, were the Homo habilis, the, the species that's best at manipulating these special actuators that are not uh, driven by the primary senses. Of course, we have a lot of sensory organs in our actuators as well. 
uh, proprioceptive and haptic and so on. That's, that's <coughs> there is no movement without sensing, as many of you will know. Okay, that's the body. The nervous system here is just this uh, translation of, so that this activation is the one that enters here, so this line is a nervous system. And so this is an idea, this is a feed-forward nervous system, right? So the, just one direction in which activation flows. Uh, if you, essentially you can get rid of the activation, but just uh, plugging, and I'll do that in a moment, plugging the intensity right into, the, into this motor by convolving these two uh, characteristic functions. Of course, but one can conceive of more complex nervous system. I'll do that in a moment. Well, the environment, um, here I've, I've drawn this by hand. Actually, I've uh, changed it to high and low uh, intensity. I used to have temperature here on it. Maybe I don't even use the temperature metaphor. So um, you can easily imagine that something interesting will be happening now if there is some variation of intensity in the environment. You know, the sensor will pick that up, will affect the motor, and the system will drive you know, more rapidly, less rapidly, maybe turn, depending on the intensity in the outside world. And what is needed for something interesting to happen is that there is some gradient of <coughs> that intensity in the environment, and it has to be on a particular scale. You can imagine if the gradient is very, very tiny, very, very small, then the differences picked up by the two sensors or the differences the vehicle experiences as it moves might be so small that it cannot be picked up from noise. On the other hand, if the intensity varies from you know, centimeter to centimeter you know, very rapidly, then the system will essentially just see noise again and will not do something meaningful. So the meaningful stuff will arise if there is some variation of the intensity on a relevant scale, sort of the scale of the body depending now also on these in the characteristics, how, how, how sh steep they are, something that effectively drives the behavior. And really, to understand that, we'd have to model the environment. So here is this vehicle, I think it's number 3A, if I remember correctly. Uh, a vehicle, uh, just as an example, that Breitenberg makes a verbal story about. Uh, this is the Texas vehicle that does uh, orientation behavior, and I'll take you through this logic and then I'll actually argue that this is a dynamical system. So the logic is that you have a vehicle like this, ipsilateral, for Breitenberg was important uh, if these, you know, what the structural organization of the connectivity is, this will be same side sensor, same side motor, ipsilateral connection. As you may know, in, human, uh, in the human nervous system, most stuff is contralateral, that the, the right visual array uh, determines the left um, or it's more directly connected to the left limb, but it's actually mu much more complicated than that. Um, and the invariant characteristics would be a negative monotonic for the sensor, a positive for the motor. So th the idea then is if you're uh, positioned like that, uh, your left sensor is closer to the source, and we have some source model where uh, intensity falls off with distance from the source. So the left sensor gets a little higher uh, intensity than the right sensor. A little higher intensity will mean it has a little lower activation it sends to its motor. Lower activation of the motor means lower motion, you know, less wheel rotation. So this wheel turns less than that wheel and that therefore the vehicle will be turning toward the source. If it's really symmetrical, once it is uh, headed to the source, both wheels get the same activation then it would go straight. As it approaches the source, intensity would increase, presumably, and therefore activation decreases and therefore wheel motion decreases, so the vehicle slows down as it approaches the source. And you know, if there's some zero crossing, it might actually stop in front of the source and then be oriented to the source. That was how this ta orientation taxis behavior would emerge from this. If you actually implement that, for instance, in our lab class, then you find that is actually not always true. Um, for instance, you can imagine if the average uh, of the input to these two wheels that determines the uh, tangential velocity is too high, then the vehicle might not be turning fast enough and it uh, passes by the source and might go in ellipses around the source and it might even um, ellipse away from the source under some conditions. So it's actually more subtle than that and to really understand what will happen, you would have to have a model of the source. Oh, that's one of the things often overlooked in discussing these things. Now, uh, what I actually want to argue is that the behavior I verbally tell here, that that's actually a verbal account for a 
dynamical system, the first formal encounter with a dynamical system. Actually, this here can be put down, but I don't doesn't seem to work anymore. Huh? Move it up. <coughs> Move it down. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> so you see the vehicle. So I'm looking at this vehicle that I just discussed when it's symmetrically headed to the source. That will be when it should go straight, will be uh, perhaps something like an attractor. Um, and I'm, I'm going through now um, the feed forward analysis of this here. On top, I have uh, made uh, a model, formalized the model of the environment. So I've assumed that as a function of heading direction, I'm taking that to be some angle in the world that describes the orientation of the robot. The intensity that these sensors would pick up would be um, that Gaussian. I just thought that down, right? So this sensor, for instance, I'm essentially uh, assuming this they're not parallel, but they, they converge somehow so that if I, I can characterize these sensors by where they're looking in the world. It's a little simplification perhaps over this. And so, for instance, in this picture, the right sensor would pick up something to the right of that midline and the left sensor would pick up something to the left of the midline and presumably at this uh, position the intensity they get is the same but if the vehicle was oriented a little bit more to the right then the right sensor you know, would slide down on this Gaussian the left sensor is higher on the Gaussian so then the left sensor would pick up more than the right sensor. Now uh, on the, the next lower level uh, I'm just making that difference I'm, I'm subtracting the intensity the left sensor will get from the intensity the right sensor will get. So in this uh, symmetric position they get the same, so the difference is zero. And as I just argued, if I'm a little bit to the right, then the left sensor will pick up a little more than the right sensor, so you have a positive difference. And in the reverse condition, if you uh, head a little bit to the left, you will get the opposite sign. Uh, so it's again just the logic of the sensor. It's closer, it gets more, and therefore it has this sign. The, the next uh, transformation is transform looking at what happens um, to the wheels as a function of what happens here to these two sensors. Between these two are just these two invariant characteristics. One is negative, the other is positive. If you concatenate those, you get something negative. That is, if you now put in a difference in intensity left-right that is positive, then it will lead to a negative difference in turning rate. This is what I just verbally did before, and uh, you know, corresponding on the other side. And if these characteristics were really these straight lines that I had, you know, these two straight lines, then you would get a straight line here, but it could be some other monotonic function. Now the last step is saying, so this characterizes what that vehicle will does, and now the last step is to say, this is actually a dynamical system. And, and this comes about by, by recognizing that the only reason why there's a difference between left and right is because there is, uh, the, the sensors are looking into different, uh, the vehicle is oriented in different heading directions. So for instance, if I take the, the top graph and I now think of different orientations of the whole vehicle, for every orientation I can pick up the, the difference in sensor intensity, put that in here, and so on, concatenate all these curves, and what I will get is a concatenation of this monotonically increasing and the straight line function, and that will give us some, you know, some curved function that will be neg negatively monotonic. Now positive times negative gives you a negative, and uh, what, what that generates is a difference in turning rate between the left and right wheel, and a difference in turning rate between the left and right wheel is a difference in the direction in which the vehicle will turn, and the rate of turning. It's actually the turning rate of the vehicle. Right? If you gi give the two wheels the same uh, turning rate, the vehicle will go straight, zero turning rate. If you give uh, you know, more to the right wheel than to the left wheel, then the vehicle will be turning to the left and vice versa. And it's a question of the sign that we use the con if, if the angle increases to the left or the right as a source of confusion. If you do that right, then you get that characteristic here. So this is the turning rate of the vehicle and this is the heading direction of the vehicle. And the last step is to recognize that the turning rate of the vehicle is the derivative of the heading direction. Turning rate means you know, how much heading changes in time. That's the rate at which heading changes in time. 
So the turning rate is the derivative in time of the heading. So what you have is you have heading, the, the time derivative of heading is a function of heading, and that is a dynamical system. Uh, the engineers will all know that. Uh, I'll formalize that again in a little while um, in the next module, but maybe it's intuitive, right? And so a dynamical system is always a ver the derivative of a variable is a function of the variable itself. So this is a dynamics of heading direction. We call that a behavioral dynamics because it directly generates behavior. If I, if I know a time series of heading, that will be the solution of that differential equation, right? It will be a time series of heading, then you know, that is, describes directly the behavior. I would still, of course, need to be able, and the vehicle is able to do that, bring about that heading, and that is by sending the right signal into each motor. We're assuming, of course, that the motors can bring about these velocities, and that will be that they are controlled, and there's some stuff there that I hinted, some control at the individual level that actually an engineer needs to design if you build a system like that. What you also recognize, uh, I uh, recognize is that this is actually a uh, special solution here. This is a fixed point solution because the turning rate is zero. So once you're in, in this uh, heading, there will be no further change. Heading is constant. This is an invariant solution. And then you have this negative slope here. That's characteristic of an attractor. This is actually a stable fixed point as an attractor. Because if you're a little bit to the right of this, you have a negative turning rate. That will mean that you're decreasing heading. And so you're going to the left. If you're a little bit to the left of that, you have a positive turning rate. That means you're increasing heading. And that means you're going there. The confusion is, I'll say that just as a practical thing. In all our papers, we're using the mathematical convention that the angles are increasing to the right. No, sorry. The angles are increasing to the left, counterclockwise. And so positive is actually to the left on the graph you now in the world and corresponding for the heading rate. So, um, so mentally you always have to invert everything. And sometimes in my lectures I just cheat and pretend that this was on the right in the world, right? Uh, and it's on the right on the graph. It's not, nothing uh, changes. It's just a question of how to plot this. So I'm, I'm using that now. I'll be cheating and always saying on the right when it's on the right of this axis. But in our mathematical models, it's the other way around. So if you ever study one of those papers, be aware that the angle goes to the left. So increasing means the vehicle turns on the left, even though on this axis you're moving to the right, right? It's just a practical thing. It's one of those conventions. Mathematicians just defined that the angles increase that way. So we have to live with that. You will see the other one in dynamical field theory that the resting level is a negative number, but we give it a positive letter. So the letter has negative value. And that's just convention. Everybody did it that way, and we have to that convention. So, so we already saw there is the behavior actually that is the meaningful one of orienting to the source is a attractor of the behavioral dynamics. And that is actually the core message of our dynamical systems. And so what's missing from the Breitenberg uh, account is, is a verbal story about how this works. And what is missing is uh, recognizing that you have this uh, stability and, and this uh, attractor state as the behavioral state. Uh, and to really formally derive that, you need up there the model of the sensor, sensor environment. That's what, what makes it concrete. It's uh, quite relevant uh, in the vehicle, uh, in, in Breitenberg's account, you would get actually, the, you can tell the same verbal story about the exact opposite behavior if the source is behind the vehicle. It would also be balanced on the left and on the right. You get the same, you know, the, these sensors are supposed to be 360 degrees so they can pick up intensity, you know, irrespective of direction. So if the source is behind the vehicle, you know, the two sensors get the same and therefore the, uh, it should be going straight and therefore moving away from the source. But it's very intuitive that that's a very different kind of behavior. It's an unstable behavior because if you have the least deviation from that, then the, uh, if you think through that logic, the vehicle will be unstable, it will turn all the way it will make a loop. It will not uh, return to that escape route. Well, if it's heading to the uh, source, and if it's heading a little away, it will be correcting and will be, will be moving here. So that's an attractor, while the other one is a repeller. And that shows that it's actually critical to, uh, to take account of that stability. It's, it's not enough to just have a verbal story about what would be a 
time invariant solution and equilibrium point or fixed point, you actually need to understand the stability, and therefore you need to understand the dynamics. That's the first point I want to make about Blackenberg. Once you've made that point, you can actually see that it does more than just conventional control. You know, control is essentially uh, stabilizing the value of some variable. Um, uh, here, for instance, this heating system is supposed to be a control system, and now it's off uh, because it's still summer. I know it's a bit approximate. But uh, if it's not off, uh, it has these thermostats, and those are supposed to keep the temperature constant. So if the temperature sinks, then they will turn on the heat, and you know, it should supposed to move the temperature back. As you know, these often don't really work because the dynamics, the model of the, the system the, the here on top is often not right, and therefore the system doesn't really reach the fixed point. Uh, but that is, of course, a system that you would say is very limited. It is, uh, you wouldn't call that behavior. And you wouldn't call it beha be behavior perhaps because it only just does one thing. It keeps the temperature constant. Maybe you call that homeostasis in organisms, but that's far from cognition. While you would say autonomous behavior is, for instance, if the system makes some decisions. And uh, this dynamics actually can make decisions, and Breitenberg discusses that. For instance, if you're confronting the system with two sources, it might be able to select one source and then uh, consistently move to that source. And intuitively, if you, once you're sort of in the now, closer to one source, then that will dominate and the other source will be no longer relevant. And that will be determined by uh, which gradient influences what the sensors pick up. But formally, in, our, uh, in this formalization, it's much easier to understand. Um, the environmental model of this two-source world would perhaps look at some distance like that. That is, there are two local peaks of intensity as a function of heading from that vehicle. And if you think of the translation that I made, the peak in sensitivity is translated into an attractor. Right? Where there's a peak, there's an attractor. And so if, I, if the logic is right, then where there's a peak, there should be an attractor. An attractor is a zero crossing of that dynamical system with a negative slope. Between the two attractors, you have to have a zero crossing with positive slope. There's no way around that if the line is supposed to be continuous which will turn out, and we'll discuss that in a moment, uh, to be a repeller. That's an, an, an in unstable fixed point. And so what will happen is that as, as soon as you're heading somewhat to the left of that repeller, you're attracted to this leftmost <coughs> attractor, which is positioned more or less over the source on the left. And once you're uh, on the right, you will be heading to the right. And you will do that consistently, even if there's some sensor noise and so on the stability of the attractor will pull you back to that particular uh, location. Most of the time you will initially be in one of the two basins of attraction, as we say, uh, these re attractive regimes, but if you're right on the boundary, uh, some fluctuation in your sensory system might push you away from that boundary, and once you're on one side, then you will be attracted to that side. So that's already some simple form of decision making. Doesn't always happen, so for instance, if the two sources are close enough that the environmental characteristic is monomodal, then the two, uh, two uh, attractors will fuse into a single attractor and you will be moving essentially toward a average of these two source locations. And that is actually uh, an instability, a bifurcation, the sort of thing that we will be studying. For instance, if you look at the distance between the sources as a parameter, you have a regime where you have these two attractors and a regime where you have one attractor and there's a critical distance where the two attractors fuse into a single attractor. There's actually a hidden repeller in the middle. This is this dashed line. I showed you that, that somehow when you have two attractors, you have to have a repeller in the middle. If not, the line has no way, no, no way of changing sign. And that's uh, hidden in between, hidden because uh, empirically it's often hard to observe unstable states because you're know, unstable, you never get there. And uh, all the three meet potentially at one point. This is called a pitchfork bifurcation. That's only possible if there's a special symmetry in the system that they meet all three, th three things to meet at one point, right? Something special needs to be there. The generic thing is that two people meet first and the third person joins later. They have to be coordinated to meet at exactly the same point. And that's the condition under which this particular bifurcation arises. This, uh, I'll formalize all these terms a little later. Uh, bifurcation is um, another term for instability, mathematically 
A bifurcation is a change in the number and nature of attractors. And uh, mathematically, bifurcations are always instabilities. That is, when that happens, stability is lost of something, one attractor or whatever it is. Good. Last point from this Breitenberg uh, <coughs> story. Um, this was all the outer loop, right? And I essentially said in the outer loop there's a dynamics and to make that explicit I had to characterize the state of the system in that outer loop and we'll make that formal in a moment. Um, the nervous system was just feed forward. So that was just information processing, input, output. But of course it's possible that in the nervous system you would have loops like that, internal loops for instance that this uh, uh, activation modifies itself. There will be self-excitation or self-inhibition or co uh, some kind of connectivity. It would be, um, it's really a loop. There's no directionality, for instance. It could really, you know, this just this activation variable that this influences that and that influences this. This is some kind of loop between these two. Um, that would be, for instance, a way you could imagine how the left and the right could compete if it's inhibitory, that Either, e either you allow the left sensor to dominate or the right sensor to dominate. That would be, for instance, a possible scenario. And a lot more structure could be in there. These would be called recurrencies in terms of neural networks. That is, that the connectivity in the network cannot be ordered in, in an in input-output direction. There are some loops where the input determines the output and the output determines the input. Um, I will argue in this afternoon that when you do that, you need uh, really neural dynamics. The only correct way of thinking about recurrent networks is in terms of dynamics. Um, and maybe f right now in terms of how it arrived, uh, this you could see that the analogous thing will happen to what happens in the behavioral system. In the behavioral dynamics that is, the system will convert to stable states. Stable states will determine the outcomes of that and I'll formalize this this afternoon. Um, so the source of things that we'll be postulating then is that these activation variables that I just had now have this characteristic that the rate of change is a function of u and that there will be attractors, there will be negative, uh, you know, zero crossings with negative states, attractors. When the attractors are at low levels of activation, we'll say it's the neuron is off or has lost or is deactivated. And when they have positive levels of activation, we'll say it's on and has been activated and there can be bistable systems that can make selections. This would be, for instance, a neural dynamics where there is an on state here and an off state and both are stable. That is, if you initially start with some positive activation, you go to the on state. If you initially start with some negative activation, you go to the off state. That would be sort of a switching neuron that would make a decision whether it's on or off. We would call that a detection de decision because if we think of the neuron as standing for something, then the neuron being on means that this neural network consisting of one neuron has detected that stimulus, has said it's what I'm standing for is present, I detect that. And if it's uh, off, it would uh, say uh, what I'm standing for is not currently being detected. That will be the elementary mechanism that we'll be using in neural fields. It will be the peaks that do that. And um, I had a similar slide for competition, which I have apparently removed can similarly think of a selection decision with two neurons, one is on and the other is off, and that will be a selection decision. So I'll uh, now, right now, without a break, I will uh, take you through behavioral dynamics more formally. I'll just start with heading direction as a function, as a, as a function I introduce. Also repulsion, uh, so attractors and repellers to do uh, obstacle avoidance, and so this is the core language of how to generate robotic behavior. We do that across the board. Ultimately, the real motor behavior is generated by that. And then this afternoon, I will do a module on neurodynamics, one and two neurons, and tomorrow then on DFT.